Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and what's next. It's a show that asks questions and peels back the layers of our average everyday experience and goes beyond scratching the surface. We interview people doing incredible things who are making a difference around the globe. Join me as we listen in and get one step closer to understanding that big ideas shared create collaboration. Collaboration can inspire community and communities create social change. I'm David Peck and this is Face to Face. So my conversation today is with Rabbi Stephen Wise. He's going to be a guest at an event that So Change is going to be hosting, hopefully in the October, October 29th, actually, called Common Ground, where we're going to bring a group of religious leaders together to debate uh, tolerance, uh, similarity, difference, and so on, and conflict and reconciliation. And we're going to have, hopefully, a really interesting dialogue. Uh, check out whychange.ca in the near future. You'll get more details on it really soon. So Rabbi Wise is the only, uh, he's the rabbi at the only synagogue in Halton, which strikes me as really odd and interesting. He's a super uh, good guy. I think you're going to find uh, this to be a really interesting conversation. It's, it's, it's got an inner faith angle to it. We talk about uh, Muslims and Jews not getting along. We talk about forgiveness and reconciliation and the whole idea of what it means to be interfaith. And I think probably one of my favorite parts of the conversation is about how the synagogue sort of came to be. There's a there's a poker game involved. There's a few poker games involved, and um, it's really a kind of a, a fun, interesting story that I think has something to say about relationships and connecting uh, connecting with others in community. We talk about repentance and forgiveness, and and and. Um, yeah, about some really interesting stuff. So, so check it out. I think you're going to enjoy it. And uh, Rabbi Stephen Wise. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We have another interesting guest today, and I know I say that every time, but it's true. All of my guests are very interesting. Today, uh, Rabbi Stephen Wise from the Sharei Bethel uh, Synagogue in Oakville is joining us. Thanks for uh, a rainy day conversation. I'm glad to have it. It's good to talk to you. Thank you for that. Uh, so you guys are celebrating, uh, you were just saying, your 60th anniversary of Jewish life here in the Halton region in November. Yeah, people still ask me, there's a synagogue in Oakville? And I still get that question. But yes, 60 years uh, ago this year, a group of men and women got together and said, hey, we should uh, get together for, for poker and uh, celebrate a Jewish holiday and have dinner. Uh, and from that innocuous ad in the local Oakville Beaver newspaper, uh, we've had a synagogue standing here for these, these many years, 60 years. Texas Hold'em? I believe so. I, I don't have so, all the details of that so first is game. Is this like some strange cultural tradition that I was unaware of? It's, it's funny. I mean, I found the ad uh, in the paper. It, oh, it's it's, it's a actual... poker game, yeah. And it, I think the awesome. guys played poker. The women, you know, this is the 50s, right? The yeah. women were, I guess... In the kitchen, I, I don't know what they were doing, yeah. and and the kids. They said, "Let's have the kids together learning some Jewish stuff, and that'll be our gathering." And, and that's how that's the, how it all got going. Wow, it's really interesting. So, I mean, talk. I mean, really, in a way, you can, I, you can't get much more community based, really. Yeah. Poker game, hanging out, dinner. Right. Maybe some lessons to, to be learned, and then a synagogue 60. Well, exactly. I guess the synagogue came a few years later, was yeah, it? Yeah, by 62, they, the building was up. So I think uh, 55 was like this early start, and then somewhere a couple years later, they said, let's have a building. And uh, story goes that this is, our property is at the edge of a huge farm hmm. called uh, Morrison Farms. And in fact, there's still a farmhouse uh, closer to Lakeshore. You oh, can okay. on the other side of this property. And so the farmer gave us the edge of his property. I think for either free or, or like wow. for nothing. Wow. And uh, said, "Sure, you can have a little building on the edge there." And uh, it's now this is multi-million dollar property. I was just going to say, have you considered <laughs> selling it and opening a casino, for instance? Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, to go back to your to go back to your earlier right. roots, Rabbi. Yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Uh, we try and hide those roots, <laughs> uh, our uh, nefarious so, beginnings. So, so if I walk through the synagogue here, would I find like a card room? In the yeah. Back? Well, the secret door. I can't really show you that, but yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I did see the locked door when I came in. Yeah. So I'll, uh, and and what's funny is a few years that, ago, there, there's been a, you know the resurgence of poker. Right, so well, we actually is... did a hold'em 
tournament to raise some money. And, and again, we got a lot of people out and uh, playing some poker and, you know, within the rules that Ontario sets. So we couldn't make the money, but we could charge to come to the event, yeah, whatever, yeah, sure. whatever it was. But yeah, people were like, poker, sure, I'll come. And, That's pretty and it's fun. again, like you said, community based, like everyone's playing, having a good time. I really don't think, you know, people come, I don't think playing cards is about the playing cards. Right. It, it used to be, I guess, about the smoking and the drinking. And yeah. Maybe it is in some, some settings still, but it, it really is about the community. It's right. about the that shared sense of camaraderie and commiseration and let's hang out, let's yeah. talk about what was on TV last night, et cetera, right? right? And, and, and one of the points was that, you know, um, there's people who take it seriously and want to be competitive, and then there's people who don't take it seriously or might not know the game so well. So yeah. we had two the divisions. B &B. We had an A and a B. A and a B. Well, the B division that was supposed to be there, the non-competitive, they were having way more fun. They were louder, <laughs> they were they were having more drinks, la you know, laughing and talking and schmoozing, and they seemed to have way more fun. The, the, the sort of the, the serious side was serious, a little more quiet, people right. hedging their bets. Um, right, I guess, uh, like, you know, I've walked through a few casinos in my day, and I guess that's more maybe the serious poker table versus the slot machines. Exactly. That's where the rowdy folk are. Exactly. The rowdy folk are with the slot machines, yeah. but the poker guys are pretty serious. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, uh, well, that's really interesting. I mean, have, uh, so is it odd that there's this Jewish community in Halton Peel? I mean, you're the only one. Yeah. It sounds like maybe this is a bit of an anomaly. It is. Jews tend to congregate in larger cities. For the most part, this is because Jews want to be in community with each other, and we need a lot of uh, services to hold a community together. You would need Jewish restaurants and a butcher, uh, a Jewish burial ground, um, uh, the ritual bath, the community center, uh, especially the more traditional you are, the, the less likely you're going to want to walk. Uh, you're going to want to drive anywhere. You want, you want to be able to walk to places. So very traditional Jewish communities congregate close together. So Toronto, Montreal, Winnipeg, uh, Vancouver, that's where the major Jewish population centers are. Now, why were some Jews out here in Oakville or other small towns? It could be more likely uh, a business opportunity. Um, I know there were a lot of building going on in the 60s and 70s in this way. Um, maybe people wanted more space. Maybe people didn't want to be part of their community. So maybe you get a little bit of the type of community that might start here, maybe the outcasts, the ones who are, you know, on their own and more independent. Um, the, po the poker players. Yeah, the poker players. And it also might be the Jews who don't necessarily want to make a big deal about their Judaism. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, which is another reason why this synagogue is kind of a hidden gem. We're on a, a, a residential street. We don't have a big sign. We don't put our name in the paper or you don't, you don't even know it's here. And one of the things that I did when I got here in 2007... I've, well, lived, I've lived in Oakville for, since 2001. And up until meeting you three months ago, I don't think I would have said, you know what? I don't know if there is one. There yeah. probably is. And, I right. I don't know where, A, I don't know where it is. And B, exactly. I don't know if it even exists. So, yeah. So, you know, I got here and we didn't even have the name of the synagogue on the building anywhere. Mm, interesting. There was one sign out on the lawn, but it was covered in ivy and you couldn't really see it. And yeah. you, you would drive by. Not, and I said, you know, are, are we hiding? I mean, certainly there's a, there, a case could be made for... Um, keeping a low profile because of anti-Semitism or, you know, we don't want vandalism. And that, that was a real fear, I think, through the 50s, 60s, post-war, post-Holocaust. Uh, the type of people that started the synagogue probably did want to keep a lower profile. But well, it started in the 50s. I mean, holy cow, you don't get much fresher. Like exactly. Five, five years yeah, past, and, and right? we still have, you know, Holocaust survivors in the synagogue wow. still alive today. So, yeah, that was a part of it. But I kind of felt the tides were changing a little bit, and it was time to get our name out there a little bit more. So that's kind of been what I think this scenario is doing. So are you are you a, are you a, are you a progressive Jew? Are you a pro sorry? I guess are you a progressive rabbi? Are you a are you a moderate rabbi? Are you an extremist? Where, where would you yeah. put yourself? Yeah, I would say I'm a progressive rabbi within a progressive uh, denomination of Judaism, right? So we, even within Judaism, there is the more traditional Orthodox and there's the more liberal reform. We are already a liberal affiliated synagogue. And I would say I am pushing boundaries a little bit in the more progressive manner. Um, and how might that un unfold for you on a... 
at a service or at a well, I don't know. <laughs> The poker already right. strikes me as a little progressive. That frankly. could be. But, um, but, well, I'll give you. I'll give you a few examples. Yeah. I mean, one is um, doing more work in the interfaith community. Okay. I mean, I've had pastors and I've had imams. Uh, I've had Hindu and Sikh leaders come and address the congregation from our bima. Um, Earlier this summer, I had a gentleman who uh, had a career of crime, organized crime, a biker, a enforcer, a murderer self-proclaimed murderer who uh, saw the light and, and wanted to turn his life around. And one of his biggest crimes was he was a white, he led a white supremacist group and he had swastikas tattooed all over his body. And he wanted to apologize to the Jewish community and he came to talk to me about it. And I gave him the opportunity to stand on our bima on Shabbat, on our holy wow. day, and ask for forgiveness. And that was probably a little controversial. And I was okay with that because I did not doubt his sincerity. Did you get pushback on that? I did not. Um, another thing that I'm trying that I have gotten some pushback is um, I was approached by the Muslim community and the uh, a local church that they'd like to sponsor a Muslim family who are refugees in Syria to come to Canada. And the pushback was um, communities should take care of their own, right? If there was a Jew in crisis, the Jewish community would respond. Right. A Muslim community in crisis, the Muslim community yeah. should respond sure, and Christian. Sure. Um, so I can't, I, it would be hard, I'd be hard pressed to think of a Jewish a synagogue, a Jewish organization that wants to sponsor a Muslim yeah. Family. It's not what pops to mind. So me when I uh, came to our to some people here and said, "Here's here's this idea," <laughs> there was some pushback, not because we're racist, but you know the the reality is that the Muslims and Jews don't get along in the Middle East. Now they can get along here, and we should get along. We should get along everywhere, but reality is we don't. So uh, are we helping to bring? the enemy <laughs> into right. the community, right? right? That's, right. That's, the, that's the pushback. Um, but, it's, but it's moving forward. Yeah, I kind of just You're was not, like, I, yeah. you know, we should do this. Uh, you know, deep down, everybody knows. Everyone knows this is the right thing to do. You do you know what? It's really interesting. And I mean, I, I almost think that, that that's what this whole podcast, this whole interview is going to be about. Yeah. What actually is right. Yeah. And deep down on some level, Muslims, Jews, Christians, atheists, whatever, yeah. we all know exactly. on some level, right? It's a family in crisis. Deep down you know that if you, if you saw that face of that person in a refugee camp and yeah. you didn't know their yeah. religion, you didn't know anything else about them, you just saw them in a camp, you'd be yeah. like, okay, this person needs help, I'm going to help them. You add on these layers of, of religion and history and then all of a sudden, well, I don't know, who are they, what do they do, do they have, uh, are they friends with terrorists, are they affiliated in some way, are they going to, you know, come to this country and stab us in the back? Um, and I just feel like, you're right, da deep down, it, we so, know it's right. So, so it seems to me, Jewish folk should be more sensitive to uh, uh, racist tendencies or yeah. r rhetoric or that sort of ideological leaning or that inkling or whatever you want to call it. Um, but do you find that that Jewish folk actually sort of lean that way more with respect to Muslims? It, did, does that make sense? You no, know, you've, you've hit the nail on the head because that's exactly the, the, the tricky part of this. On the one hand, liberal Jews know that we survived the Holocaust. So we were refugees. We were kicked out of our country. We were attacked and murdered for being Jewish. So we know that it's happened to us, so therefore we should go out of our way to help anyone of any religion who's being attacked and persecuted yeah, yeah. and killed because of their religion. You, you would think so, yeah. Yep. On the other hand, because of what Israel has faced from the Muslim world, we, we have our, the hairs on our neck are up. You know, we are acutely aware that there are Muslims in the world who don't like us for no other reason than that we are Jewish. And so, yeah, maybe we're a little bit 
more wary of the Muslim community because of that. And that's, it's a stereotype, but yeah, we live yeah. it. And, you know, there have, it's not like we, there have been attacks on this very synagogue, vandalism, hmm. uh, you know, eggs thrown at our door, and uh, they tried to break in a back door. Um, there's swastikas painted on... Yeah, see, that just boggles my on, mind. Yeah, on bus stops in Oakville. Yeah. So yeah. here I, I tell a, a 90-year-old woman in my congregation, don't worry, don't worry. It's a different world. People don't hate us anymore. And she has seen the worst of humanity. Right. And then she sees it again. Well, how can I tell her it's all gone away? She carries yeah, the scars. Yeah, well, and in her. truth, we know it's not all gone away. Yeah. It absolutely hasn't gone away, I think. And I think that's kind of what I was hoping our conversation could be a little bit about. And as you know, I'm working on an event, an interfaith event in the in the fall of this year, trying to bring five or six different leaders together to talk about some pretty, I hope, right. um, not not necessarily contentious issues, but but issues that are difficult, that are yeah. not that we don't necessarily want to face. And, and I'm not really sure where it's going to land. Right? Yeah. In, and, in, and here's the question for you. So you set up an interfaith event, a common ground event. Do you think we're going to need security at that event? Right. Good question. <laughs> and you know what? In truth, I, I, I'd like to think not. Right. Um, and I think I would probably uh, say we're not going to hire them. But because we're meeting at a, a public uh, place, they may, they may actually ask for it. Right. Uh, it. That is possible. And we may and we may be having an ambassador coming to the event. So if, if that uh, a, a, a Canadian ambassador comes... That actually might right. might change things. Well, then so you might, wouldn't, yeah. That, wouldn't that be interesting right. if we had to do that? Right. Yeah, because I guess even having an event like that is going to upset a group of people because, mm -hmm. hang on, so let me get this straight. All these people who should actually hate each other are in the same room together? Right. Right? Right. Right. Which, so extremists on either side would say, why are... Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Why is my leader meeting so, with you? So... so as a rabbi, as a leader, as a as a as an academic, as a you know, you've studied the Torah and so on, and, and this all this interfaith. Why wouldn't somebody want to have that conversation? Like, I just don't get it. Like, how do you know? I mean, I know we're talking about the problem of evil here, right? You know, and 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 you look at the banality of evil, and I read right, and 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 how does something like Nazism take hold in such a massive? It's just it's mind boggling when yeah. you start to unpack it, but. How could somebody look at this event that I want to do as so change in the fall and go, that's a bad idea? There probably aren't too many logical reasons why it's a bad idea. Fair enough. But there are fears deep down in people that, um, that can't simply be talked away. You know, it's, it's, um, perhaps it's something that's not logical. It's a deep-seated fear. It could be something implanted in someone by a parent, by a teacher, that the other is wrong, you know, that there's something to fear. I mean, I'm, I'm glad we don't live in the type of uh, cities that I read about in the States that are so racially divided you can't walk into certain neighborhoods, right? You, you wouldn't say that about Oakville or even Toronto, although maybe there are some parts of the city that you don't want to go to. Sure, there are, but right? not, not, I don't think there's too many. Yeah. I mean, I, I know there's certain areas you probably wouldn't walk through. I was with a guy from uh, the UK recently, right. and I probably mentioned this on a recent podcast, but uh, Mike loves his name, and he's doing a lot of community-based work uh, in some pretty at-risk neighborhoods. And yeah. We were in the distillery district together, and we went for a drink, and I was just kind of showing him around a little bit. And on the drive back to the airport or wherever the heck we were going, he said, i got to tell you, I'm really impressed with just sort of the ease with which so many different groups of people hang out together yeah like i mean we, I, I didn't i didn't notice it it was right. i think we went into a couple shops we wandered the street and yeah. so i guess he was seeing a lot of different races yeah and we we probably you know, do take it for granted we do, I, I would think on some level what's wonderful about you know the, our, our country but you know i think it's because we grow up in an environment hopefully where our parents our teachers our leaders are not homophobic they're not xenophobic there's no built-in racism, uh, you know, um, because I think that's where it starts. So getting back to your question, well, why would some people think it's a bad idea? Well, some people are so stuck within their own communities and, and their community is doing things the right way for whatever reason. You know, why are we talking with those other people? They believe, I mean, if you strongly believe, let's say, that 
that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And if you're not following that way, you're going to go to hell. Well, then why would you talk to a Jew? They're right. hell bound. Right. So right. Right. what's the point? Right. Um, and there Dude. are there are elements of, of radical Islam that would suggest that we are also so wrong that we shouldn't be practicing our Judaism, our religion. So why even bother talking to these people? Do, do you really think that this is a religious problem? So, you know, you, look, you watch a film like uh, a Kingdom of Heaven, for instance, okay. which, you know, sadly didn't get uh, uh, rated too well, I don't think, by the critics. But it's essentially the, the, the wars right. of what? How many years ago? A long time ago. Yeah. Lots of blood, lots of swords, yeah. lots of flaming balls and things like that. Um, Constantine, et cetera, et cetera, the Crusades. Yeah. And, and you, get a, you, get a, you, you sort of get a sense, I think, on some level that this must have been about religion. This was about conversion. This was about the, uh, the other, right? Maybe small o, not capital O, or a misunderstanding of the other. But on another level, I go, Hank, yeah, this is about greed. This is about pride. This is about arrogance. It's about knowledge. It's a ph so so backgrounds in philosophy. So I go. It's a philosophical problem. Right. Because I think I'm right and you're wrong. Right. I don't care what scripture I use. I don't care what holy book I use. But maybe you use that to justify taking off somebody's head. Right. Or setting their house on fire while they're still inside of it. Yeah. But anyway, so. There's a part of me that today, you know, when you hear some of the, especially some of the really radical extremism, sorry guys, this has nothing to do with religion at all. Right. You like to kill people. Yeah, yeah. And or you've got an issue on some other level. Yeah, you know? and, and that's why we have to use our language carefully. Uh, you know, I think if someone attacks another person and kills them in the name of religion, it's not an extremist or a terrorist, it's a murderer. Murderer, plain and simple. Um, I was... You know, that's like in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right. they've started to turn the language, use the language that's appropriate. If someone kills, it doesn't matter what they believe in or how or why, if they kill, it's a murderer. And and I was sad sad but proud that there was a recent awful, awful thing in, in Israel this past week. Um, on Thursday or Friday, a settler set fire to two houses. Heard about this. And murdered two, a, a child or two. And, and um, whether he knew the children were in there or not, because he also burned down an empty house, that was murder. And the Prime Minister of Israel said that was murder. This, and they found him, and they, they're going to put him in jail, and he'll have to suffer the consequences. So it doesn't matter where ideologically what he believed in. You can think whatever you want, and you can believe that this land is meant to be for me and not you. But when you go beyond that ideology, philosophy into action mm -hmm. and take someone else's life, you are no longer within the realm of religion. You have moved to, uh, to, to another category. Well, it's power, yeah. I think, yeah. on some level. Or it's an abuse of power, I suppose. And yet we love to, uh, it seems like we love to classify it as a religious issue right. or a religious problem. I mean, I think, aren't we on, I, and I guess this goes back to the question I asked you earlier, why wouldn't somebody think an event like, you know, where five or six different religious leaders were actually talking and hopefully coming to, to some consensus, right. you know, even though there's a, uh, all this difference in the room, maybe right. there's a few things we can land on and actually right. make sense of. Uh, I, you start to, get, start to get a better idea of why somebody might think this is a bad idea. Yeah, and, and I feel good about... Um, when I do talk to younger people, because I, it could be a generational thing. I, you right. know, when I, when I go into high schools and talk to youth, they're all about, like, well, of course we should talk together. I mean, this, uh, it's totally normal that everyone of different faiths and different colors would speak together because they're growing up in an environment where that is more and more the norm. And their philosophy when you're younger is how do we get along? How do we uh, smooth out the differences? And, and create a society that's, that's more equal in that way. So I get inspired by the youth when I speak to them. On the other hand, when I do an interfaith event and all the kids are saying is we're all the same, we all are right. pretty much the right. same, we have the same philosophy, and we all treat each other with respect, I also want to say, yes, but there is room for differences. Yeah. I mean, 
I don't want to whitewash us yeah. all till we become robots and we're all, you know, believing exactly the same thing and doing it all the same way, right? That's not the kind of world I see do, anyway. Do you, do you think, I mean, just to sort of launch off that a little bit, do you think that we're, um, do you think all religions in some way are pointing to the same God? That they just have some kind of, a different way of expressing it, a different way of appreciating it. It's kind of like prayer or meditation or, you know, I mean, you know, not, not that, uh, not every man and woman for themselves, but right. do, do you know what I'm saying? I do, yeah. I do. And, you know, and it's a tough question. It's a big Well, deal. you could be killed for saying it in some <laughs> I places. I you could. But yeah, I think that Jews and Christians have certainly gotten along into a place where like we believe in the same things. We're very similar. We have some differences in how we approach, but we're very similar in the idea of a deity, of a God, of a higher power. Islam as well, right? The three biggest faiths of the world well, this is, are the most similar. So I'm getting a little shiver and I'm going, isn't this really true? Right. You know? I mean, what not that an incredibly true statement? But like you say, in some places in the world, you're, you're going down for making yeah. that statement. Yeah. Yeah. Even within a faith, I mean, what's scariest about sort of what I see in the Middle East in terms of ISIS is th these, are, these are sects of Islam that are so competitive with one another, they behead each other because they're not following in the right way. And I look from an outsider and say, but you're both Muslim. How can there be such differences? See, and this is where I would go back and I'd say to that guy who was sharpening his sword, hang on, this isn't religious. This is a problem about knowledge. Right. Sorry, I'm the philosopher in the room, yeah. but the way you define what you know as being true is, is, is problematic. Right. Let's unpack that a little, yeah. and then maybe we can see a few of the inconsistencies and right. you can put your sword away. Right, that's exactly. What I, that's what is I'd it like really about think. religion, or yeah. as you said earlier, is it about yeah. power, is it about conquering this land, yeah. and then creating some sort of pan-Arabian Muslim state, and, and but th that's not what your prophet would have said, or what God would have wanted, it's, it's or you. Or most of the Muslims I know. Right. Right, and yeah. most of what I, and most of what I've read, I haven't read the whole Quran, but I've spent a fair bit of time uh, yeah. looking through it. And uh, anyway, it's uh, it's 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 kind of, I guess, what's mine. So so you made a comment earlier, and for me, uh, something that I'm landing on more and more, and I think some of the French and the German existentialists in, in, in the in the in the you know, the 20, early 20th century would probably have written and thought about this, in fact, I know they did, this idea of similarity through difference, mm. right? Um, that, yeah, we're all different, but hang on, we are all on the same page still. Right. We just might, there, there might be a little bit, maybe that maybe, maybe that, 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 that connecting line is a little more jagged than, than another right. one, right. right? Maybe it's not a straight line, yeah. but in some way we're all sharing in this big, fat mess, wonderful mess together, Yeah, right? Yeah, there's got to be some sort of moral code that we could certainly believe in and all ascribe to. Uh, some sort of understanding of seeing the, the, the holiness in each person and treating one another with respect. And whether we believe in one God, multiple gods, or don't believe in God at all, we can still understand that you might believe it in this way and I believe in it that way. Um, if we could find some sort of moral, uh, a universal moral code, yeah, that perhaps we've always we've been trying throughout since the Enlightenment, we've been looking for, and if we can all ascribe to it, then you can, yeah, you can say, well, I'm going to dress a different way, I'm going to eat different foods, I'm going to pray in my own way, but there's a certain moral code why, that we and, all and, live by. And why is it that let's let's assume a moral code, let's assume something that we can all agree on, all of us, all seven billion of us. Why are we so threatened by other approaches and other ways? Yeah. You know, I, I, I currently do yoga. I came out of a very conservative tradition. If I was to talk to certain people within that tradition about the fact that I practice yoga, mm -hmm. they would be pretty concerned. Yeah. I remember, I'm a magician, sleight of hand magician. You know, I remember playing with cards and dice and things, and holy cow, I mean, I, these were the tools of the devil in, in the world <laughs> that I grew up in. <laughs> And certainly, there are still schools of thought that would think that way today. But, yeah. but uh... well, listen, Judaism still feels that we are a, a tiny religion in the world, population-wise, and we are under attack that it w that we could just fade away into history. I mean, there's been so many times when we've been tried that people have tried to do, it, and we've we've managed to stick around. But you know, we are territorial that way. I mean, we have one homeland and we'll fight to the death to, to keep it. And 
you know, I still believe very strongly that Jews should marry other Jews. Not because I don't like other people, but <laughs> but if Jews consistently marry other faiths, the likelihood of their children being Jewish is 50% less. And then if then their kids marry out, then it becomes 25%. And when and you say Jewish, you don't mean just lineage. You mean... Uh, you practicing, mean, practicing Jew. Or, well, or, or born to a Jewish mother or, you know, with, well, that's how we establish your Jewishness. You're born to a Jewish mother. So either born to a Jewish mother or converted into Judaism. That's right. That would be what I preach and demand from my congregation. In fact, I only officiate at a marriage between two Jews. Um, and mo a lot of rabbis would say the same thing. Um, there is perhaps value in it interf Well, I mean, I'm getting more into Jewish, our own mishigas, as we say, that, you know, even if a Jew and a non-Jew get married, there's still potential for that to be a Jewish family based on how the kids are raised. So there's definitely merit to that. But this idea of us trying to circle the wagons and set up, even in the Torah, we call these fences around Torah, these fences around ourselves to prevent assimilation from us just fading away into this seven billion person global unity, which we all um, think is nice, but as Jews, there's something about our own history that we don't want to let go. Uh, we've survived so many thousands of years, um, it's our duty to keep it. So there is a, there is a definitely part of us that, that sets up walls and protections. Do you think that sort of pre, um, um, hmm, do you think that sort of sets you up for division, in a way, a mindset? You know, I mean, I got, I have a seven and a, a almost ten year old, and it's really remarkable. Uh, from time to time, I will reflect on, wow, you know, if they had been brought up in a family in the deep, deep south in the U.S. that had uh, roots with the KKK, hmm. they would be thinking very differently today than they are. Right. As, you know, and so, and I'm not suggesting there's any similarities there, yeah. but. It just it, it makes me wonder, um, and and I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with it either. I just I wonder if it if it sort of sets you up for being. Um, uh, hmm, I was going to say anti-interfaith, but that right. might be that might be too well, strong. No, I mean I think it, it's not within the Jewish um, way to auto, to automatically be interested in other faiths, right. right? It doesn't say anywhere in our scriptures that, oh, and also, not only should right. you follow God and the Ten Commandments, but uh, those Christians down the street, you should be friends with them too. There's nothing in there that says we should. And in fact, it's the opposite. It was, we were so worried about the other faiths that were around us that we set up roadblocks. Don't go into a church, because when you go in there, you might be you know, you might all of a sudden join. You might be poisoned. And, yeah, or, yeah, or right. don't even, uh, yeah, don't even drink wine, only drink kosher wine because the Christians use that wine and that's the blood of Jesus. So we set up all these protections uh, uh, in, in Islamic worlds. I mean, don't go into the mosque, don't go into the Hindu temple because you might, you know, and, and that's what I don't believe, even though it doesn't say it in our scriptures, I, that, what I teach my kids is let's go and learn about what's going on in those other places places of worship, it's not going to make, I don't think it's going to make our kids like, oh, wow, I'm going to be Christian today, you know, because I saw it's great over there. I think it's the opposite. I think kids are, are I, I'm going to teach my, our youth to be so in love with their Judaism that when they go in there, it'll just be like, oh, wow, that's so interesting. We do it this way and they do it that way. Right. It just strengthens right. their right. own identity well, and I think in response. In some way, I think we can bring this, uh, bring this back to this whole idea of uh, uh, similarity through difference. I right. think, anyway. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's something that I, I want to continue to think about and continue to talk about and hopefully interview others about in the future. This event that we're doing, which is title, entitled Common Ground, by the way, in October tw October 29th, for those of you out there that are interested, uh, it's going to be held in Mississauga at the World Vision headquarters. We're uh, uh, hoping to have a good group of panelists uh, and religious leaders talking about some pretty interesting things. Thursday, October 29th, so wait for that. I want to talk to you about um, uh, wait for it, look for it, and put it in your calendar. Um, what about reconciliation and forgiveness? I mean, this is, this is really, it's got to be tied in not only to the event that I just sort of jokingly uh -huh. referred to and uh, hoping people will buy tickets to, but from a Jewish perspective, I mean, so much of your past. I, you know, I, as my listeners know, I spent a lot of time in Cambodia, 
Uh, and I'm working on a project with a man who fought with the Khmer Rouge and lost a leg to a landmine. And I mean, he's just starting to w understand a little bit of what post-traumatic stress disorder, I don't even know if he knows how to pronounce it in right. English. So, so the, uh, for them, it's so close and so fresh, and we're f it's 40 years ago. Yeah. But I, on some levels, the Holocaust to me has got to be still so close and so fresh. For the Diary of Anne Frank's playing at Stratford right, right now. You know, so can you ever really forgive that? And then, and then, and then as you look into the future with mm -hmm. this, what appears the the, the extreme Muslim uh, uh, um, edge to ISIS and those kinds of things, do you just say, well, that's just a small group of people, mm -hmm. or, or you know, I mean, I just forgiveness for me is is. Uh, a profound uh, move, it seems to me, forward. I had this thought the other day that we were all, I don't care who you believe in or what you believe in, but we're all here to get better at loving one another. Yeah. As corny <laughs> and as let's pass a joint around right. the room, that sounds, you know, it's very hippie-like. Yeah. It's very 60s-like, I suppose. But honestly, I think I think that's kind of why we're here. Yeah. It's, it, you know, forgiveness is, is, is a part of, as a part of Judaism, repentance. But in our in our teachings, forgiveness means you forgive someone if you can say that they, in the same situation, would that person do it the same way, right? Then you forgive. If, if you say the same situation would come up, and you would that person would act in a different way, then you can forgive them for what they've done. And so you you kind of so have for, to. So your so your your forgiveness is based on me repenting. Yeah but also acting. So repentance is acting. Exactly. It's exactly. not just saying I'm sorry. So so for example, I was quite I was quite shocked when I read about the church in uh, I forget where it was in the southern states that was bombed uh, that was attacked recently and uh, a man went in and killed the pastor and the yeah, eight like, people in the prayer yeah, group. Yeah, insane. Yeah. It, South Carolina maybe. Okay. So a few days later they they had the person on trial and all the victims families said we forgive you right yeah yeah and that struck me because I said to myself what is forgiveness would that the attacker do that again if he if he had the chance I think he would he's still in the same place he's still for whatever reason wants to kill black people because of his own twisted worldview. So is it too easy to let someone off the hook like that for, for their crimes? Um, on the other hand, when you forgive someone, you let it off your own chest right. and put right. it onto them. So right. then you're like, well, right. I'm not, I'm not going to deal with you anymore. You are it's beyond my comprehension. I'm not, I'm not going to waste my energy and time on you. I'm going to get on with my life. I'm, you're forgiven and I'm going to move on. But so, again, and to translate that into the into the larger picture for Jews in the Holocaust, um, or or anything yeah. for that matter. I mean, you, you know, know, our our mantra, our, the mantra shouldn't be forgive, forgive, forgive. It's uh, don't let it ever happen again. All right. So when we, we 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 how can we forgive Nazis for murdering six million? I don't know if you can, and finding these ninety year old Nazis and putting them on trial, and you know. <laughs> that's not going to bring anybody back. So the better lesson is, well, let's create a world where that type of thing can never happen again. We won't forget it, and we're not going to let it happen again. And so that's where I think we should steer towards. There's an amazing scene in Schindler's List where Liam Neeson and Ray Fiennes are talking about they're getting drunk together on the balcony and they're yeah. smoking cigarettes. It's a be beautifully shot cinematography, it's unbelievable. And they're getting, and, and Schindler says to M. Goeth, the death camp leader who shoots Jews from his balcony, mm -hmm. uh, w when he's bored, seemingly, yeah. no, no, uh, M. in real power is, uh, is basically forgiving, right? right? And so they have this whole conversation about power. And then the next couple of scenes, and I can't remember it exactly, but I remember using, I've used this in a couple of classes that I teach. We see a scene where he's about to beat a young boy who can't get a stain out of his bathtub, Yeah. right? Yeah. And he says, no, I pardon you, you can go. Right. And the kid 
looks at him stunned and down he goes down the steps and then we see Ray Fiennes looking in the mirror saying to himself, I pardon you. Like he's yeah. practicing because he's, he's never done this before, right? right? right. And then of course the next scene is him shooting the boy yeah. from a distance because he couldn't, he couldn't do that. So he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't even have the ability, right? I mean, it, it, it powerful, powerful stuff. Hmm. Yeah, there's. Yeah, that is that. I mean, that whole movie turn tries to turn things on its head. It really right? does try to turn things on its head. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, and this is. I think this kind of connects back to one of the earlier questions I asked about all of this in the first place. What is this really about? It's about. It is about power. Right. I really don't think a lot of this is about uh, power, economics, greed. Right. You know, the, the lust, these types, these types of things. Uh, that about I don't really think it's 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 about right. religion. And and, and in, a, in Canada, religion doesn't have power. It it really doesn't. I mean, a little bit here and there. But I find that I live in a country where religion doesn't have much power. So when you have an event like this common ground event, it's not going to be about which religious leader is going to talk the best. Like a, in a leadership debate, you know, we saw our debate last week. Who can make the best arguments in order to gain power? A common ground event just is is where you're you're not trying to convince everyone or pull everyone to your side. You're just engaging in the dialogue for the sake of talking out issues. And so, when no one has that power, worry about how much power they're going to get out of it. You can actually get down to real issues. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me if if we were going to sit here uh, on on a stage with six or seven different uh, religious leaders and academics from different 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 face and we could say okay we're gonna hit a fast forward button where do we want to be in 25 years or right. 50 years or 100 or whatever it is do, you know is it we can all are we all wearing t-shirts that say we all get along <laughs> right right and yet we still practice in our own specific ways and we're not afraid of it is that where we want to be I think so I think so that's that I think that would be the ideal is this as is, is a world where we can maintain our own uniqueness our cultural uniqueness our religious uniqueness but know that no one else is going to attack you for being who you are and 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 everyone has a deep respect for one another despite their differences so we got to wrap up soon, believe it or not. We're, yeah. we're almost at the 40-minute mark. It always boggles my mind how fast these conversations go. What do you think about the whole... I mean, I think this connects to the forgiveness debate. I remember working with some former Yugoslavians and the whole Croatian-Serbian thing, and, 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 and it sounds so... Uh, like I'm just sort of tossing it away to the side. It's, it's way deeper than just a thing. Right. But this deep violence, this deep hatred that seems to go back hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, are there solutions to some of these problems, you know, to the Palestinian, to the Jewish problem, the whole lobbing of stones and burning down of huts and firing of rockets? I mean, is it ever going to end, you know, or are we just, is this, a, is this really a pipe dream? Well, I guess what I like to do is try and find small examples of situations where it is working and say, can we build from there? Um, there's a summer camp that brings Israeli and Palestinian campers together here in Canada. And all of a sudden when they get out of that cauldron of heat and stones and rocks and they just hang they out bring, together they bring at a lake. From the Middle East yeah. here? They hang oh, out together cool. in Halliburton and sit by a lake and uh, you know the fire the only fires they see is a bonfire and roasting marshmallows. Well then they see each other, they know each other's names. And all of a sudden, all that other stuff seems to melt away when they realize they're just two 15-year-old kids who have a lot in common. And when you put a face you know, and a name to the other, then all of a sudden that otherness disappears. It just becomes, no, it's my friend Aviv or my friend Mohammed, and we are just two boys. So that, that's an ex a credible example. Um, uh, situations where and that happens every summer. Yeah, yeah. How many how many kids come over? Is this like a, a uh, not you know a huge amount of 50, 60 kids? Yeah, you know, those still, kinds of that's things. That's amazing. Um, there is a a lot of. I want to know how they react to the mosquitoes and the black yeah, flies. Exactly. I want to know. <laughs> they pull up machine guns and they blow <laughs> them away. Right. Uh, yeah. So there's other examples in and around. And I guess I'm using Israel as an example because it is still one of the you know one of the most difficult. Uh, situations of resolving peace of you know a conflict that's lasted so many years um, 
Another example is uh, where a Palestinian uh, living in, let's say, Gaza Strip needs a surgery that they can't do there. They bring them over the border and they go into an Israeli hospital where the Israelis see a person in need and not a Palestinian, just a person who's sick and they heal them. And the Palestinian comes into a hospital of the enemy and they're thinking, oh, I'm going to get into some hospital and they're just going to stick a knife in me and roll me out the back door. Right. But yet they're seen as a patient and they are treated. And in fact, w the news never covers the good stuff. Well, this is like a, the, the Palestinians that come a on a daily basis. Of, I think you it's know, a yeah. big part of the problem. I think, yeah. I think you really, you've tapped into something. I think we, mo and it's the same with the, the, the community I work in, the sector I work in, in development. What you hear are about the people ripping off. You yeah. hear about the corruption. You hear about the bad leaders, the, 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 the leaders who are stealing from the UN, et cetera, et cetera. You don't often get to focus on some doctor right. who's given most of his life to take his family to work uh, in, in, in Malawi, yeah. right? You know, helping uh, orphan children. Right. You, don't, you don't get that stuff. And if you do, you don't uh, you don't focus on it quite as much. It yeah. doesn't get the. Uh, it's not as bells. exciting. It's not, yeah, as exciting. it's not as sexy, it's, and it's, it doesn't, get doesn't sell papers. Yeah, but it's reality, and so that's you know that's where I see hope. These seeds of hope, where small situations, people seeing each other face to face, um, that's where you know humanity enters another picture, and it, and it you move away from. Just seeing that other, those Jews or those Muslims who hate us. Yeah, but put two people in a room together and talk it out. I think that'll go away. I hope. <laughs> That's actually probably uh, a pretty good place to, to, to end the interview. I always feel like, you know, there's, uh, you know, one of my favorite phrases is there's so much more going on than meets the eye. Yeah. And it seems to me that uh, you know we've we've touched on quite quite a few things in, in our conversation that we could have kind of gone a little deeper uh, into, but maybe uh, well you are uh, you know if all goes well you're going to be a guest at the event. Uh, I'm going to do another shameless ad for it October 29th um, in Mississauga. Uh, look for it. Uh, we're going to be advertising about it, and who, who knows maybe Rabble will even be a. A sponsor as well. Um, thanks for joining us today and for uh, sharing some of your thoughts and opinions. Rabbi Stephen Weiss from the Sharei Bethel Synagogue in Halt, the only one of its kind, um, founded apparently not on theology but a good game of poker. So, <laughs> uh, 60th anniversary, right? Absolutely. This Excellent. November. Uh, Very good. Yeah, we're excited to celebrate. Thanks thank again for having thank me. Thank